as you have seen the order has changed a bit with the cameras because now game breaker is not rep only replacing lobster but he's replacing me in the far right corner uh, also i'm joined as always by my faithful friend co-caster iced who's gonna help me co-host this event and let's mention the other stars because today is another day with full lineup captains and we have fly captaining team uk we have pokrovac captaining uh, team czechia with a lot of success actually in this weekend and nonetheless we have trish fangirl captaining uh, norway how are you doing guys how are you Good, good. Fine, fine. How about you? <laughs> I am fine. I think you, for, I think you forgot Game Breaker there as well in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, this weekend has been crazy. Do, do you have any moment I see that kind of caught your attention and that you wanna interview the guys about before you we actually start? Is there anything you wanna ask them about? Um. Yeah. So this week we've seen. Uh, that most of the time uh, people were actually surprised with the meta and uh, with the tournament itself, like especially as a, from the viewer side, uh, not everyone uh, might have known the format. So I wanted to ask you guys because we've seen some interesting lineups and some interesting choices in the decks from you guys. Um, this goes to all, to all of you. Is this format what you really wanted out of a tournament like this? And was, were you surprised or how did you do with this format in general? Uh, since nobody's starting, uh, I personally think the format is one of the worst formats I ever played in any card game. I think, uh, first of all, best of three is uh, uh, best of three in a card game. I'm not a fan of, and I'm not a fan of the amount of decks you can bring into a best of three. Uh, but that's just that's just like mildly my thoughts on the format. I'm not a huge fan of it at all. Like, for example, I personally agree with the with the best of three. Like that's just disaster, like total. But if you if you think about like the format and you think about like team competition, it's definitely something spot on. You know, like it's pretty similar, like uh, as the Hearthstone Global Games, for example, was, and it was like definitely one of the one of the most skillful formats that I have ever like ever played. I think I think team format. I I really love the team format by all means. I just think uh, the best of three and the amount of decks you bring. It's uh, what I'm not a fan yeah, of. Like, I I I don't agree. Like with I think like the amount of decks is actually, if you can bring like more decks, then the more skillful the format basically is. And like yeah, best of three definitely sucks in every card game. Like best of five, best of seven is definitely better for better players. But but what we can do. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think it should be best of five. Like it was supposed to be best of five, but for yeah. some reason they changed it to best of three. And uh, with the decks, I mean, I don't mind it being nine. My bigger issue is that it's a like a team format, but it's just one play player piloting all the decks. Like I think it should be switched, you know, between the players. Mm -hmm. You mean like yeah, forcibly switched or? Uh... No, he yeah. means like he means like uh, may maybe we play like three games at a time, like everyone plays one deck against one guy of the other team, something like that. No, no, I mean like it being a team uh, in a call as a team, right, uh, of three, but you can uh, dedicate different players to play different decks because someone might be better at a certain deck, and you sometimes you have to make a last second decision, right? And if you're better at the deck, then you're more likely to make the right decision, right? But well, I believe you can. I communicate I'm sorry, but I I believe like you can do it, right? Yeah, if you communicate like, well, you can change. Matter. You can change the players between the games. Like first game can be played by, for example, you. Second game can be played by another player. I believe. Yeah, you can. You can switch mm -hmm. pilots between so every game. So it's just up to you. Well, they haven't really made that too clear. Uh, well, they said you can, but they sort of. Uh... You directed directed us towards like, having it. Like you can definitely change who plays on Saturday and Sunday. Oh yeah, yeah, you can change that. No, sure. I think according to rules, you can switch between every game. But yeah, I mean, you can you can definitely switch between every game. According it's pretty to much rules. impossible. Like for you, Pokrovac, it's easy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you guys no, are in the like, same room. Yeah, we are. But... 
like for ex like it's definitely better to be at same room because you don't have any miscommunication going on and you can actually train because for example as as i have experience in global games like the teams where didn't practice the communication part that was just like much worse much worse result for them and it's same here like if you if players are actually not communicating well it's actually costing them much more percentages than for example bringing like worse decks than the other team or something it's definitely yeah. same here i mean that was really interesting to see is uh you guys from team chat were actually the only team that were physically all in one room uh was it hard to set up or like did you just happen to all live kind of in the same area no, no, no. We are from, we are all from Prague, but the bootcamp room is in Liberec. But like you know, uh, I'm a professional team, and we are just having bootcamp room, so it's pretty easy. They just drive us in, and we were, for example, like the first week, we were, we were there like for seven days practicing for the tournament, and then we are every time on the first day going here and leaving on Sunday, and preparing for the four days uh, in a row just for a tournament. Damn, you that guys. That sounds pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, you guys got full on on this one. Preparation, uh, boot camp, everything, everything. That's interesting. We have even, for example, like the mental coach. Damn. Ooh, okay. That is absolutely next level. Uh, I think on the other side, we, for example, have uh, Team UK, where a lot of people like might even not be in the UK. And uh, <laughs> is it any hard to uh, communicate uh, between the three of you? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> let's not talk about that. Matthew just decided to, you know, uh, UK has lockdown right now, so he was like, going to Mexico, whatever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's five hours behind, so it's actually a bit difficult uh, that way, because, you know, he wakes up five hours later than us, basically, right? And uh, me and Spikes were actually thinking about maybe, like, doing a similar uh, thing to check here, but uh we live way too far from each other like it's like a five hour drive so i mean it's also this situation that doesn't really permit people to gather together yeah yeah exactly yeah lockdown <laughs> yeah don't want to get in trouble with the police <laughs> god damn it covid just end already so we can have live events and get drunk after <laughs> <sighs> Now, I think we could move a bit to the game side of the events and I think the first games we are going to discuss is going to be Czechia versus uh, Germany because that was, I think, the first game the, on, from this group that was streamed and uh, how... Iced, do you have something to ask Game Breaker right here because you are also from Germany and maybe you have something to ask <laughs> regarding their strategy, something? Oh, um, personally, I have to. I have one question. Um, you guys obviously went with uh, two SI Freya control decks on day one, playing both of them. Um, was that a met meta read or a personal preference? Because I know that at least uh, two players on Team Germany are like used to or like are very well uh, with playing like slower and control type decks. I don't know if that's the same for you, but uh, mm -hmm. what was the decision behind that? Uh, it's it's less personal preference than just a, a meta call. Basically, we expected uh, Czechia to play some more tempo slash aggressive decks, um, and we felt like if they didn't want to play against Freljord Shadow Eyes, they would have to spend two bands on it mm -hmm. instead of one. And um, the thing is that we we also expected the Undying deck actually. Like a lot of people thought we wouldn't expect it, but I actually played against Pokerock a couple times on ladder when he tried that deck. So we definitely thought that it could be a possibility. Um, and we actually didn't think that the matchup was going to be that bad because the version that he... That's what we didn't expect. The version that he played on ladder against me was a little different than what they ended up bringing. Like a lot better against control, I think. Um, which is probably because, like he said, they expected us to play more control-heavy decks, so they made the Undying deck better against control. It's natural, good call. Um, but yeah, we ended up, we actually got what we wanted, like we wanted to play Shadow Isles Freljord against like Fearsome Aggro um, and the other aggressive decks, uh, but they played it really well, so yeah. 
And within the, the meta read there, was there also the decision to not bring a Trundle Trunomir ramp because you guys had the Trunomir in there. Might have been like a, a small a fake out where you guys put Trunomir in there, but in the end it would look more like a Lidros control deck than a run. Oh yeah, definitely. That's deck. that's a cool thing you can do in this in this format, for example, with the closed deck lists. Uh, where we, we just we just put one Trindomir in there because Trindomir is just a good card in any Freljord Shadow Isles deck that has ramp in it. Um, but we, we thought that if we prepare for aggro decks, we want more anti-aggro tools and we don't want to play a 12 mana War Mother um, and feel the rush wasn't legal anyway. So we just figured we would play a Trundle Ladros control. We would put one Trindomir in there so people would think it's just standard War Mother. It's kind of like the same idea than what Austria did. Uh, on uh, Sunday, they played one Callista in Shadow Isles Freljord. <laughs> um, it's a little more extreme than what we did, right? It's just a more extreme uh, example. I want to say, just uh, we did the exact same thing as Germany on Saturday. So we, we brought Ledger's control with Trundle and just put one Trindomir in. I think that's one of the cool things you can do in this format. Like, uh, nine decks is, is a lot of decks you have to find. There's, it's not obvious which decks you bring, because what you're used to on ladder or in tournaments where you only have to bring three, you always see, like, the, the top tier decks, right? But when you have to bring nine decks, that's where you have to start being creative, think about lineups, and that's what I think is really cool about this format. Yeah, I mean, now we can go to Team uh, Chechia. Uh, Check yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, you guys then uh, brought the Undying deck, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were surprised. Uh, it, it kind of uh, put like some people like, okay, what? They have like a Twisted Fate deck or something in there, uh, but mm -hmm. in the end, it was the Undying deck. Uh, was the preparation like against playing control, so you put in some more late game cards, uh, like Game Breaker just said? Mm. I, like, I was having like around like 100 games with a deck, and yeah it was just like preparation seeing the stats and you know for example like our preparation i believe is a little bit different than any other team because we are having for example like full excel tables with all the matchups so we just see all the percentages and we are just super easy to tell like what matchups are good for us what bonds are good for us if our opponents are making correct bonds or they are not and this is like what we are doing. Like we are just putting everything on, on basically just on data. And yeah, the Undying deck was like insanely strong versus the meta decks if you ban correctly. And yeah, it just was proven, I believe. Actually, regarding to that, I'm curious about uh, the other people, about you guys. Are you mm -hmm. surprised that any, n not any team has offered the help maybe to recruit you, to walk you through a boot camp like Pokrovac and his team has undergone? Are you surprised about that? Fly, for example, are you surprised? <laughs> I mean, this this uh, tournament hasn't been that well advertised, so actually not that many people even know about it outside of the LOR community, right? And uh, Bob Kravac, you were already in that team, right? Yeah, so. I was already in the team, and the two guys which are playing with me, they are not part of the team. So yeah, it, it's not just, it's not because of this event, but like our team basically owns the bootcamp room and I can go there anytime I want, spend there any any amount of time that I want. And it's also like the, the bootcamp room is in a hotel, so I have a hotel room in there for free and everything is just set for us. So for us, it's super easy to prepare at one, at one place and yeah, spend time together, work on communication, work on, work on mastering the matchups, mulligans and everything. I mean, Gee, sign me up. <laughs> 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 Actually, yeah, I don't think it's surprising because like uh, Pokerwak is is well known for Hearthstone already, so it's not mm -hmm. a not a not a problem for him to find a team. Uh, but but Rune Terra is just in a very early phase, so it's very it's not very expected that. I totally agree. Like the Rune Terra, they are actually working like on making pretty pretty good pretty good game and like yeah. with advertising, it's not perfect time for you know like making big big tournaments offline and everything it's just like i believe they are trying but it's really hard it's really hard in in those times i think the game is very good and by time it's gonna grow we have we just have to be yeah. patient. yeah 
and we we are going to have to wait for those LAN events, for those live events. I think everyone is itching to see each other face to face, talk to people, <laughs> communicate. But we have to wait a little bit. So uh, I think Iste had uh, some miscommunication. He was under some weather circumstances and he arrived just in time for the avalanche of fearsome units and finishes. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> how did you feel, Iste, when you arrived and you saw that amount of fearsome unit from Czechia? <laughs> thrown at the face of Germany. <laughs> Actually, Game Breaker, how did you feel when you've seen so many fearsome units thrown at your face and you're like, yep, that's it. <laughs> how are you supposed to feel if they drop the harrowing and we don't have ruination, we lose, that's how it goes. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, even, for example, like, even if you were having the ruination, that game was pretty much over, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. We, we had, we had, we had we, second wing, and yeah. even if you cast the ruination at turn, we just go for the 4-1 with Mark and you're yeah, yeah, yeah. when we have double doom beast, we, so. yeah. we we got we went over the games we analyzed what we could have done mm -hmm. uh we found some plays where maybe we could have done some better plays but i think at the end uh the way you guys played it and the way you guys drew you would have beaten us regardless of what we would have done yes i agree with that so. seeing that you analyzed before the matches and kind of walked through the matches seen what was good what was wrong but i have one big curiosity do you think that you could have done anything differently in the deck building phase, in the preparation phase, maybe the ban phase, that would have changed kind of uh, the games? I mean, afterwards, you're always, you can always say things. Like, if you see the lineup, you can always know what you could have done better. I think our preparation was fine. I think our lineup was fine, and I think that the matchup the matchups that we got were also okay. Like, we were unfavored against the Undying deck, but I think against the Fearsome deck, we had a good chance with both of our decks. Um, so I don't I don't think we, we would have changed anything looking back. I think it's fine the way it went. Yeah, switching a I bit mean, to you, Pokrovac, um, did you expect this kind of lineup, the lineup that you have seen from Germany? So that's why you kind of prepared yours? As I was saying, like before, before the stream, uh, we expected seven. We like perfectly, perfectly hit seven out of nine decks with Germany and eight out of nine decks with uh, with uh, England. And as another thing, like we with bands, we exactly, exactly uh, hit three out of three in Germany and three out of no two out of three in with with UK. So yeah. I believe like the the preparation was spot on and exactly was going just how we wanted. And outside of preparation, would you call yourself as a person that likes to play with numbers, see the percents before he plays into a game, or are you more of a person that likes to learn from experience and play and gather the experience? Like. What I'm doing is just like having big data before I'm going for the match and then I like analyze the data, actually see what they are saying to me and then do all the preparation and go to the match. So yeah, for me it's not about winning or losing, for me it's maximizing the percentages to win and minimalizing the, the mistakes we are doing and yeah, we are actually making everything. We are like, we are talking about everything, we are trying to make every single think that we can every little break in the wall and every little percentage we can gain we are trying to gain it and oh, nice you're I mean, kind of clinging to every single thing i see you now have the word yeah. i was just saying this this might be necessary because uh, i think a lot of people called this I me mean, include the group of death uh, because this is a group where we have a couple of teams that might be uh, favorites to go really far into the tournament even once we go into the knockout stage um, so whenever you have a group with like so many teams that can potentially make it out, it's uh, always about like who has the best preparation and uh, who shows up on the day. So even though the first few matches are already over, I think this this group is gonna get really interesting. And is there any pressure like on on you guys because this is just a strong group, or is this just? It's just it's normal, so no hard feelings that you got drafted into this group, basically. Any of you can answer. Uh, 
I don't really mind getting drafted into this group. I think we are the weakest team by far. Uh, both, especially when I hear about the uh, amount of preparation the other teams have put into it, uh, I really applaud it though. But in the end, right, you got seeded into a fair seed based on how we got placed down. You can't really complain about that in the end. I think it's uh, completely fine, even though like I'd prefer going into another group, but still, still part of it. I mean, and which group would you change if you had the option to switch? Which which country would you switch places and be in another group? I wouldn't have switched group. I'd switch uh, stopping being bad at the game, so I'd actually <laughs> not mess up and maybe being able to win. That uh, that's probably what I would have done differently. <laughs> uh, how about I mean, you, Fly? Do you feel any pressure? Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously. Uh, these are just all really strong teams. We uh, we've obviously not been preparing as much as Czechia. Maybe we should prepare more. And hearing all this makes me think, you know, um, we haven't really put enough work into the, the last week. Um, but I think I feel like we've already put more work uh, into preparing for Germany this weekend than we did for last week. So, so Germany be ready. In other words, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking about preparation, uh, how did preparation go for day number two fly? Because day number two it was you versus Czechia and some things didn't actually click. Could you care to elaborate what, what did go wrong? Maybe it was the deck building phase that we have said, maybe the bands? Well, uh, when it comes to the draft, I don't want to make any excuses, but uh, I said this before the stream, we were told 10 minutes before our game that uh, their discard deck is actually an Anivia deck and then uh, another deck is slightly different but that, that wasn't a big change because it was basically the same deck just with a different champion but like that discard to Anivia change completely changed our draft and we had to adapt in like 5 minutes basically like 2 minutes after we were told that we were asked uh, for our first ban so yeah we didn't really have much time for that one um, and yeah, basically, I think we, we, we got outplayed in the draft. You know, we, we picked this after our bounce, we picked this card because it had the best matchups in like the, the most good matchups into the decks. And they obviously knew that. That's why they picked the worst matchup for the deck. So, um, and then obviously the talking. second worst. We've been talking with Gems on the restream and he said that you guys are very comfortable and you fly are very comfortable in particular with this card aggro. Why is that so? I just played a lot of it. I'm an aggro player when uh, uh, aggro burn was good. I played the aggro burn when uh, MFGP was good. I played MFGP. I played a lot of scouts, a lot of discard. I just like aggro because I like quick games and actually think like sometimes there's quite a lot of uh, hard decisions in, in those decks as well. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people might think they're easy decks compared to like control or combo, but actually there's a lot of small things that you have to think about, mainly about the uh, enemy deck. I mean, I always call uh, aggro in general as a fragile archetype because with control you have some breathing room, but with aggro, if you if you play one unit wrong instead of the other, you might lose the game. What if you queue one spell wrong? Do you agree with that as well, or maybe you have a different take? Yeah, that's true. It definitely depends what you play against. Like some matchups are just very easy. You just play your cards and win. Like there's nothing the opponent can do. But like against control matchups, like against Avalanche, you need to think. You know, should you develop on free or should you just open attack or yeah, stuff like that. I also call this card aggro kind of clunky. Do you agree that it it sometimes hits high highs and sometimes hits low lows? Yeah, there seems to be no in between. Uh, I think this weekend we got pretty unlucky with our draws. First game it wasn't so bad. It, it, I feel like it, if we drew in the second game, as we did in the first game, we would have won that second game, but like the first game was impossible because they drew two whales and like you know the whole deck just completely counters ours. So. Yeah, as you mentioned, Spooky Karma obviously uh, super strong there. Um, but you also mentioned if you had the same uh, cards in the second game, you felt quite a bit safer. Was it also because the matchup, because uh, Fiora Shen is just something uh, you expected to take the win against and go into a third game? 
Uh, I, I say it's a 50 50 because it, it's very dependent on Jaws. Uh, if Fiora Shen draws Fiora, they, they can easily win with Fiora. And if they draw, um, what's it called? The four mana heal card. Uh, Spirit Refugee, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, then obviously that's a win con as well. And if you draw badly with Jinx Sacker, then you know you just lose as well. So it, it's yeah, it's a fifty-fifty. I would say. I mean, we, you all still have another weekend, and then after that another weekend to improve. Sometimes it just happens like that. You draw badly once, maybe twice, but. As I said, you have much time to improve. And let's switch a bit to Norway and to Trish because he's sitting there patiently for a lot of time. And you guys didn't really have a game streamed already, but I think every team is gonna get some screen time. So I'm gonna ask you about your game with Germany that was on day one and that was off stream. Uh, could you guys tell us about the banning phase a bit, the decks that have been played, because the people didn't see those games? We had uh, Germany on day two, and oh, day two. Uh, I think uh, preparation-wise we have spent the least amount of time prepping decks. Uh, mostly because I, well, none of us knew each other from before, so we spent the times we practiced working on communication mostly and see how we gel together. Uh, matchup wise, we uh, queued least Lian said into Heimer Y in the first game and we felt fine about it, but we got put into a really hard spot where we went all in on them not having Pale Cascade on Y. Uh, we felt that if we didn't go for the attack there and go all in on that, we would lose the next turn when we lost Zed because at that point we didn't have Lee Sin in hand either. Um, so they had Y, well they had a pale cascade for Y and we lost from that point in game 1. That's how it felt. And in game 2, I made a terrible, terrible call. We had two mistakes, I think, but I had made a terrible call at the end one, where I didn't see that Lee Sin didn't level up when we went all in on a play. Uh, so I felt really, really bad about that. I feel really, really bad about that still, that I, we had a chance to stay in the game. I felt that we were in a bad spot, but... Uh, I don't know how it was from Germany's side. I think that if we didn't misplay, we would probably still have lost though, but yeah. How did things feel from your side, Game Breaker? Did you feel that that attack into the Vi when you had Pell Cascade was greedy? Do you think that it was an ed educated uh, assumption and an ed educated play? How did it feel? Well, so basically, what the exact situation was, I think they played Z on 3 or 4, and we played a Y. Then they Zenith played it the Z to a 4 4. Mm. And then they spent their last 4 mana to Bastion the Z up to a 5 5 and attack. And we had exactly 2 mana open. So the play, basically, they play around Hush, but if we Pale Cascade the Y, the Y goes to 5 health and just blocks and kills the Z. Yeah. Um, well, we had the Pale Cascade, so from our perspective, at the first moment, it looked like, wow, uh, such a such a weird play to not play around the Pale Cascade here. But um, after thinking about it later, it might have been the correct choice. Sometimes you have to take risks in card games. Um, even Just because we had the Pale Cascade doesn't mean that the play was wrong. Um, that's results-oriented thinking. You should never do that. Because if we don't have the Pale Cascade, maybe it gives them a better chance at winning the game. Um, we had the Pale Cascade, so we pretty much, yeah, we had the perfect counter. Like, they spent four mana Bastion and Zenith played on the Z, and we just took it out with one Vi and Pale Cascade and won the game from there. But it's always easier to say, oh, that's a mistake after the game. But, uh, yeah, it could have been correct to, to just go all in. Sometimes you just have to. Yeah, I don't remember hand exactly, but I know that we didn't have Lee at that point in hand either, so it was like... Yeah, I mean, if you don't yeah. risk it, if you don't we, risk it, and you don't have hush, we still pull the Z next turn with our Vi, anyways, right? So like, yeah, I don't have any regrets. It's, maybe it's just a bad spot, and you have to risk it. it yeah, I don't, right. don't have regrets about that game. And game two was the least at Firoshan game, which uh, uh, the one yeah, that we at the exact situation. I just remember that you went for an attack with Lee Sin, and you don't have any more mana, and it just didn't flip because it was at seven out of eight. Yeah, we got uh, denied on Senate Blade, uh, yeah. which we had the choice to p play another game and then have mana for Nopify to stop single combat and kick the dragon out of the game, mm -hmm. uh, which was the correct play to do there. But uh, I didn't notice it, and I made like a really, really bad call that Marcus would have gone for. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just me being bad pretty much that we sealed the loss there. It happens. Don't worry about it. Yeah, in fun, you, you are just learning. It's a learning experience as well because you get matched to, against top-notch players that are preparing their lineups, that are usually performing and... Yeah, it's, it's tough sometimes. You have to take the L, prepare for the next weekend. And uh, Pokrovac, we have a question from the chat. Uh, is the Misraise yeah. deck... Um, only tournament, only prepared for tournaments, or he, or can people from the chat just net deck it and play it on ladder? What do you think on that? Actually, I have to say it was the best performing deck on ladder for us when we were trying it on ladder. From all the like, we were trying like around thirty decks, and it was the best performing deck. Yeah, from all. So definitely, you can you can go to ladder. Like I believe, like if you are like if you are good. You don't care about what you are playing mostly. Like you can play like one of ten decks and you will be climbing with it, because on on ladder you are actually it's actually pretty simple to climb. If you want to climb, you will be mostly most likely to climbing like in in long term performance. Like of course one day you can be losing LP, but if you play like for fourteen days in a row, you will every time you every time should be climbing if your if your game is good. If your game is not good, then it's it's irrelevant what deck you are playing, right? then you need to improve. Yeah, you, you need to get your mind space right before you actually go into the game as well, because if you are going in there frustrated, you don't have your gaming mode. Yeah, on. of course. Like, of course, tilt is, tilt is some some different team, you know. <laughs> it's definitely like, there's definitely like, that's definitely like chapter for itself. It's really big one. And I have a personal curiosity, would you change the Misraise deck a bit now that you have seen the patch and the changes, or would you still play the same variant into the next patch on later? Mm, I don't know, I didn't even saw like, I saw like little quick the patch notes, but if I look into that like more, more complexly, or how should I say that, I will I will. I can tell you that. But right now, I don't know what's what's gonna be good or what's not gonna be good. But I thought like it will be a little bit bigger. But you know, from what I have seen, I don't think there will be like super huge changes. Yeah. I mean, talking about the patch notes, obviously we can't go through them right now. But it is still a pretty big patch uh, considering the last two patches we had. Yeah, definitely. And we will have a big meta change up. So there was a lot of talk about preparation coming into the week. So next week might be a bit harder. So um, this goes again out to all of you. You are free to answer. Do you feel a bit safer? Do you feel excited? Or are you a bit nervous about the next meta, about the next weekend? Because there are so many changes. Okay, so for me personally, it's a little bit of all of it. I think it's very exciting. But it's also just a matter of time at this point, right? Because it's, it's Tuesday. Uh, the patch is in effect tomorrow, right? Yeah. yeah. So we, we have ba basically have like two and a half days to test decks in game, uh, which is going to be a challenge, right? Not everyone has always has time. Like we we meet on Discord every night usually, but like we don't we don't have infinite time, right? Because I'm a student, I have to work stuff like that. Um, we have to see how much we can prepare, and it's definitely going to be a big advantage depending on how much you can prepare for this weekend. Because I think that the changes are quite significant to some decks and. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be possible to find some really good decks, I think, for this weekend if if we manage to find them. Yeah. And regarding to the patch notes and the patch changes, do you think that Riot shouldn't touch the game in this period? Because as you said, you have two two days and a half basically to prepare, and then you go in and try to do your best. Do you think that they? No. I don't even think it's a bad thing necessarily, right? It's a cool it's a cool factor to see how fast can people adapt. That's also a skill. How fast can I see which deck is good? How fast can I build a good deck without seeing like weeks and weeks of stats on ladder, right? How far can I how how good can I build a deck from the scratch, right? And um yeah, I think it's exciting. Also, I don't think they should wait just because 48 people are playing a tournament, right? The entire community wants, wants patch notes, wants to play an exciting new game, right? I don't think they should wait because of us. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. Like, they, they should definitely not be waiting with that. But, you know, like, this preparation will definitely be much more harder. And, you know, like, it will be the same for us. We were playing, like, 12 hours per day when we were at the boot camp. But, you know, 
we were like ahead every day when we were preparing we felt like we are ahead of any other team this 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 week it will be like not we will not be that much ahead because you know like the time that we can spend will or time we will gain with the prep it not be that significant like for example when we were preparing for 10 days you know so this weekend like it's it's gonna be much more closer for us definitely <laughs> and so it's gonna be really exciting to watch i saw that reaction fly when you heard 12 hours <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's quite funny because you guys are the youngest, and I assume that you don't. None of you work, or do you guys go to school? No, I'm not going to school. Like I'm just I'm just full player, playing properly. Yeah, players. so you guys have more time than us. Like most of us like are a guys, lot older. The, guys, the Michael and Thomas, they are going to school, and they are like attending the school like f online from from the boot camp. Oh, I see. Yeah, like I, I, I'm in my final year of university, so obviously I have to spend more time on that. Um, like Game Breaker, so he's at uni as well. Yep. And, like, yeah, of uh, course. Like, working, everybody, so. like, you know, like I definitely can see that. Like everybody is having like different approach to their life. You know, everybody wants, somebody wants it more. Somebody is playing more. Somebody is preparing more. Like for me, it's that's what I love and it's what I'm doing, you know, and I want to be like each day better. So that's what's my goal and that's how i'm living basically i think that's totally fine though i don't think it's unfair or anything that's just what we sign up yeah, for yeah, yeah i'm not, I'm not yeah. criticizing him i'm just saying you know like yeah. we I, I wish i wish i had that much time <laughs> i don't uh, i don't think i have that much passion for Intera to play that much even if i could but uh i still really really like uh having meta changes during a tournament i think that even though i'm a terrible terrible deck builder in Intera, uh i still think it's a lot more fun for viewers and for myself to watch what people can come up with within a few days. And as you said, uh, Game Breaker, it is a skill in itself to be able to uh, adapt to that environment. And speaking now about... That you uh, go ahead, Aisty. Okay, so now you mentioned that you are not uh, necessarily a deck builder. I don't think everyone has to be. There are some players who just are really good at playing other decks. Um, was something that was mentioned on broadcast and we also mentioned in our while we restreamed and casted the games is that uh, in a team format uh, there are like sometimes uh, just roles given to like each person in the team have you noticed something like this is this like how you guys do it or like uh, is like everyone's doing the same thing or is like someone hand tracking the other ones like uh, preparing some stuff uh, no like I said like uh, we don't really know each other team as well. So most of our preparation were communication wise and getting used to each other. Um, and we have branched out since none of us play very, very much in Terra in different degrees. So we have people practicing different decks to make sure that we don't overlap on what decks we are comfortable playing with. So that's like the primarily thing we do there. And uh, Radagar, a teammate, he is building his own decks and is good at that. So we have him we had him, we charged out some of his decks, and we were going to bring them, but they sadly overlapped with the champions that were in the s tire deck, so we couldn't bring them, or we could, but we thought that it would hurt us more than uh, than uh, bringing his decks, sadly. Can I ask you, actually, uh, what, you know, the first day when you guys played against us, why did you pick deep twice? That was that was like a giant, giant, giant mistake, if that answers your question. We, uh, yeah. we were happy the first time we picked it, and... Uh, personally, I tunnel visioned a bit, I think. I think I forgot the fact that you don't have to win with every deck or play every deck, which I'm kind of used to. <laughs> so that was just a mistake. We should have picked something else. That's uh, that's about it. And I want to kind of come back to the seizing the opportunity and seizing the right deck from the beginning because you you had an interesting and still have an interesting deck game breaker. You have the Heimer Vi, so I'm curious about when, why, and how did deck this deck came came about to life. <laughs> I don't know exactly. It was it was at some point during the LOR Masters, the grind before the cutoff. Like a couple of weeks before, uh, I just tried a lot of different decks and I didn't find anything that I really liked. Uh, like obviously, it's always easy to just queue like a, a top tier deck and play it well and just climb a little bit. But at some point, you just have to find a deck that that you are really comfortable with. 
And I tried a lot of different decks and nothing really worked super well. And at some point I tried Heimer Vi and I, felt, and I, I tried some standard lists and it felt like it had potential, but it wasn't like sick or anything. And I was just, so I just like changed a couple cards that I think would make the deck better. Like took out the Flash of Brilliance, which was something that I feel like everyone considered a staple. And I just didn't really understand why, because like it's only good when you ever establish a Heimer and never good if you don't have Heimer. And like even if you have a Heimer, 3 1 Fearsome does nothing against uh, certain decks. Um, like against control decks, if you want to pressure them, like the 3 1 Fearsome is just not as good as a 3 1 Elusive used to be. Um, and yeah, from that point on, the deck just started winning. And I just had an insane win rate up to being like first in Germany. And so I played it the entire season up to the up till then that point, yeah. I think it's pretty good. And it also just happens to be exactly the style of deck that I love. Like a little bit just a little bit control, but not full control style, because I think that can get a little bit boring from time to time. Uh not a big uh, aggro fan, but like the middle ground is like is pretty cool in my opinion. Yeah. And how much time did you spend with Frontera? I'm actually curious uh, and qualified because I don't I don't think I've seen you around for much time in the LOR community or in the game. <laughs> I basically I've been I, I started playing the game a couple months ago because I'm I'm normally I, I used to used to be a Yu-Gi-Oh player full time, which is like uh, it's offline it's obviously offline card game, but um, I always I, I could never do two games at a time like I tr I played Hearthstone like casually but well I, I played competitive Hearthstone but not at a full level because I was always focusing on Yu-Gi-Oh and it took a lot of time but with the with lockdown and everything there are no events obviously because Yu-Gi-Oh is not an online game and uh, so I tried different games and uh, I, I really like Runeterra uh, I think it's one of the one of the best games that I've tried I certainly like it more than Hearthstone and, and Magic and stuff like that and um yeah, so I, so I just stuck with it. I just started playing, and I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at card games in general, so it didn't take me a long time to learn it. Um, obviously, there's some concepts that are new to me that are not in Yu-Gi-Oh! because the game is very different, but uh, the general idea of, of logical thinking when you're approaching a card game, uh, I'm pretty good with that, so it didn't take me a very long time to start seeing some success on Runeterra Ladder, yeah. Alright, I hope you find this game fun uh, in the next patches, in the next expansions and you still keep playing because it's, yeah, from my experience personally, it's the most balanced game, the most interesting, the most in-depth, the less RNG game that we have right now on the market. Yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot and I, I don't I don't plan on, uh, on stopping if it stays like that. <laughs> don't stop till you get enough. Um, and let's move a bit to, I think, what was the last game that we didn't talk about. And I think it was day one, Norway versus UK. You mentioned picking deep twice. How was that game uh, from your perspective, uh, Trish? It was very, very, very interactive, both games. <laughs> uh, first game was deep versus uh, the fake war motors, which actually got us. We thought it was, uh, we thought it was war motors. Oh, nice. And, uh, well, uh, we played deep, we got the yeah, jettison in our hand, we kept it, which we weren't sure about. That's like the first decision. Uh, and we had shot the docks on tree. But apart from that, uh, we drew all three withings, Withering Whales. No, I mean, a Wild Feast. And we drew a Withering Whale, and a Vengeance, and a Nautilus. And we drew three Joel Hunters. So we whiffed every single thrust card. We, oh, we had a Dread Dredgers as well. So Dread Dredgers, Jettison, and Slaughter Dogs were the only thrust cards we got, which kind of stole us a lot, even though the UK didn't have any ramp. So we basically didn't really have any place we could do until uh, until Trundle. Uh, uh, yeah, Trundle I was on the board on turn 8, right? With double pillar. And we had one choice because we told it there was War Mothers, so we assumed they had Trindamir in hand from the Babbling Bjorg. So we had one decision we sh think we should have done, which was we should uh, Vile Feasted the Trundle when he played one of the pillars. So if he played the second one to be able to uh, move one of our second big guys, we could have uh, used the Devour of the Deeps on it to kill it. So you either had to save Trundle or you could play Trindamir, which was what we should have done. 
but we ended up decided committing to you guys not having atrocity in hand because we felt that if Trindam had dropped, um, if Trindam had dropped after doing that, we would lose anyway because our hand was completely, completely bricked. Yeah, that was a plan. Did you? I didn't check the deck. Did you guys play uh, three or two vengeances? We only played two vengeances. Right, because you, you discarded one and you played one, and we were. <laughs> we were so worried about playing that atrocity uh, when we had to block to not die with the trundle because we weren't sure if you have another another one in hand or not. Yeah, no, but that was just a complete brick, right? We had three toss cards in the entire game and just useless cards, which was uh, it was pretty bad. And the second matchup, we missed Q deep, which was terrible. Into and you guys picked the uh, the night Nightfall, Yeah. And we had only one decision to make that turn, because we managed to toss every single Wild Fist in our hand as well, and not be able to play turn 1 and turn 2. Uh, and that was when we played the 3-2 lifesteal. And we could choose between attacking and you can commit the trade, or we could commit to you guys not having Diana in hand. And we felt we were so far behind that we just had to hope you didn't have Diana to be able to get a good trade with that one. But tossing all 3 Wild Fist was kind of bad for you guys, like knowing exactly what we could yeah. do. So we lost that. We lost that in like four turns when he surrendered out. Yeah, it was like yeah. a complete break. Yeah, it was. It was very one-sided. I think it, it was very very we, one-sided. We attacked on two and four, right? And we just won on four, I think. Yeah, we surrendered on four, I think, because there was no way we could come back into the game at all. Yeah, we took uh, seven damage on turn two, I think. I want to go back a bit to game number one, and you said that it was fake, fake war mothers, didn't? Like that bubbling beer give it away that it wasn't really War Mothers because I don't think many lists play bubbling beer. That's kind of it, a staple for Ledros control, if I remember it correctly. Should, it should have given it away, and I noticed it was like bubbling beer. This, uh, and I asked, uh, I asked my team, uh, is this being played right? Because, uh, because I mean, I played for three weeks. I played again for three weeks after, with, like between the beta and. Then I didn't play until three weeks before, so I was like, okay, is this like normal for war mothers or not to play that? Because that was a thing in the beta. And Marcus said that, like, no, that's not normal at all. And we just kind of skipped it, like, okay, I guess they're just playing babbling during in war mothers. But in hindsight, we should have understood that something was up because I've been playing Ledro style as well when I qualified some, and I know that you play babbling Bjergs in that deck. So, uh,. Just low, low game awareness on my side. <laughs> what do you guys like? Oh, he's just playing one bubbling Björk to throw us <laughs> off. It's definitely War Mothers. <laughs> no, it yeah, feels like makes sense to get Trinda in, right? It still makes sense even though it's not optimal. It's uh, it's not the worst card you can put in a War Mothers deck. When uh, we were talking about the draft, uh, when we saw Deep, like my teammates wanted to ban it, I was like, don't ban Deep, it's the worst deck in the game. <laughs> yeah, uh, Radagar had like a lot of success with it on the ladder, right? And he said that on war like against War Mothers, it felt good. Feel the rush is like not that good because you kind of just lose if feel the rush hits and you're not into deep and with a board. Yeah, but... we knew uh, we knew you would uh, pick it because we knew one of your players really likes it. Yeah, I think that uh, we're being predicted a bit too much, and I'm just gonna like throw a roulette, like a dart on a roulette next time or something, and just go with whatever it lands on. <laughs> Pretty interesting though. I mean, uh, <laughs> overall, I looked at like uh, the 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 uh, the meta uh, in the groups, and what you see is that now you've mentioned that you think, for example, that uh, deep is not that good. And yesterday we had uh, quite a discussion where uh, group uh, one actually thought that deep was not that bad and it's actually uh, an okay deck or pretty good deck. We also saw way more Soraka Tom Kench out of them. Well, we really didn't see Soraka Tom Kench here. Uh, so it's interesting to see that different groups have different meta reads. Um, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this, but what do you think about the Soraka Tom Kench? Is this a deck that you might have overlooked, or is it a deck that you didn't bring because you thought your opponents uh, would have answers for it? Who is this question for? Everyone. everyone uh, we, we actually brought Tom Kench Soraka uh, with one Twisted Fate. Uh, like, our whole lineup was basically to counter aggro. And neither Norway or uh, Czechia brought like a very aggro lineup, so we we just didn't yeah we didn't pick it because we didn't feel like it would be good in, against the decks. 
Yeah, we brought uh, we brought Soraka Brom instead, which we felt did kind of what Soraka Tom is trying to do, but just a bit more reliable if you want to queue into aggro. But yeah, we were really confused about that. Did we did we ban it? Uh, no, you let it through, but you guys had too good of a matchup against it because it's super super polarizing. Like you beat you you absolutely demolish aggro and some of the mid range decks, but anything that can remove your Soraka and Brom. Uh, you just you're just gonna lose eventually. It's no point queuing it into slower decks. And we are talking about that bias between people thinking that dip is good, people thinking that dip is bad. Why did you guys bring it? If uh, was it Radagar's preference, Radagar's comfort deck, or what was the reasoning behind? It was more that we felt that it has good matchups and we tried to bring a bit of variety. Like, due to no champion overlap, you're a bit more limited in what you can bring and can't bring. Uh, and I so said we felt it had some good matchups. Like, we were confident in uh, UK picking, like, not confident, but we thought that UK could bring War Mothers into the first game, which turned out to be Ledros, whatever. So, like, that was like a good matchup. We felt that we could bring deep into and win uh, comfortably in. Uh, but it's not like, to me it's like, Deep is not a great deck, but I think that with bands you can make Deep into a pretty strong deck that works into the matchup it's good into, right? Because if you queue Deep into Ladder, it's like half the top tier decks is just going to demolish you. No point. Fair point. I think uh, Germany brought Deep day two, right, as well? Mm -hmm. Germany had deep on day one as well, which was uh, like I don't know, like I really, really loved like all of your deck preparations, like how you like how you teched all of your decks. It was like a lot of cool preparation. I like the deep list you made, which was uh, super, super, super monster heavy on it. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, I think deep is deep is not a great deck in Runeterra ladder system right now, but I think you can do a lot of cool things with it in a in a format like this, because. Deep does lose to some of the popular decks, but it does counter some other decks. Like the, the mechanic is is really strong against certain types of decks. And um, on ladder, you're kind of in the situation where you don't know what to build your deck for, right? Because every game you're going to play against a different type of deck, you don't know. Can I make my deep deck anti aggro? Do I have to make it removal heavy to beat control decks? Do I have to? go super greedy to go deep very fast or flip the Maokai really fast against certain matchups. And in a tournament tournament format like this, you can do things like that. You can just say, I, I put no anti-aggro into my deep deck, and if they have an aggro lineup, I will just not bring it. And that's okay, because you only have to win with two of your nine decks, right? They banned three, you have six decks left, you only have to win with two. If deep is not good in the matchup, don't bring it. I think that's like where like a deep take is weak. It was too uh, generalized. We should have uh, we should have like targeted the matchups we wanted for it even more uh, with how we built it. Mm -hmm. And that's the. Uh, there was one thing that uh, brought uh, my attention. You said that deep is not good on the ladder, but it's good in the tournament meta. And I see that this kind of tournament format saves Runeterra when patches usually miss. When patches uh, prove that one deck is very overpowered, that if you play it on ladder you have massive success, you turn to the tournament scene when you can ban that deck, you can build around other decks and you can still have fun. And that's awesome yeah. about Runeterra. I'm actually interested in something because I remember Pokerwalk, you played uh, the Twitch Rivals, the first one for Runeterra, which is way, way, mm -hmm. way back. And I remember you brought Deep into your lineup. How do you feel about Deep then versus how Deep is now? Like before, Deep was pretty cool deck, I believe. Like it was having, like you know, like Deep right now. Like Deep right now is every matchup between 45, 55. The deck is definitely not bad. But the problem is the deck is like not having like insane matchups, not having like really bad matchups. You can beat every deck, you can lose versus every deck. Which is a problem for the deck and on ladder, with your version is like exactly as Gamebreaker was saying, like you will not have the best version versus the meta you are actually facing, which is real problematic for deep. So right now, yeah, at Twitch Rivals the deck was really good and for example, like I just like made I just made like one mistake which cost me the game at Twitch Rivals and and otherwise the deck was the deck was like doing like perfectly fine yeah, it was really 
it was, but it was like it was like different different times back there and it also yeah. like the different meta and everything but so it's not really comparable but yeah yeah no you back, can't compare back there, but back there it was back there it was good yeah you can't compare how it was back then very very different game yeah I mean, you, could, you could say that about every deck, like every deck yeah, was definitely. once the best deck on ladder. I think Deep was like amazing once, right, as well. I remember yeah, I for, for like two weeks it was literally the best deck that everyone played Deep. Yeah, Ezreal had... is another great example of this this whole interaction where it's... Right now you can use Ezreal Karma in tournaments to, con to counter control decks. It's really good against certain control decks. But if you try to clamp ladder with Ezreal Karma, you're just gonna lose every single game against against aggro probably mm. um, yeah it's just super yeah. dependent like it's super dependent what you are facing and like on ladder you can also like you can also make good calls because sometimes when you are for example like playing at night you can play totally different decks than at uh, at a day because at night there is like four or five players playing for example at higher master and when the day is on like between like for example i don't know two and six for example there is like 100 player playing you know so it's totally different mm -hmm. and so i believe like you can easily play like karma as real for example at night when you are facing like just control decks and yeah but it's just like it's just to find those small advantages that you can that you can find uh i'm actually kind of curious like uh let's just let's just just go start to all the teams there uh how much like in-house preparation do you do, like practicing practicing against each other, contra versus on the ladder? Because I feel like when I play on the ladder, I can get away with mistakes. Well, not mistakes, but at plays I will never be able to get away with against a proper player. Uh, mm -hmm. I can pass turns I will never be able to pass against a good player because they will punish me for holding my mana. Uh, so like, I said, yeah. I will. I will tell like something. What I really do believe, like this is not like about how how like it. It doesn't matter that if you are playing like with win rate sixty five or sixty three. That's not the thing where where the better teams are taking like their advantage. The things it's it's the preparation. It's the knowing how to ban because we can see like when I'm having for example the table at Excel, we can see easily the deck is having like the win rate fifty three, and then we have deck which is having like win rate sixty. And for example, someone banned the deck with fifty three percent, otherwise or like rather than the deck with sixty percent win rate. You know, so there's just like seven percent minus, and it's totally different. It's just one deck. You know, if you'd make like three times, it's around twenty percent just like put into trash you know and for us like this is where we are like getting the advantage like the play like for example when we were playing like this week there was not that there was not a single hard turn for us basically there was like not a single turn in those five games where it was like super hard turn where we were not able to make like one of the most correct plays possible you know I'm not saying like you will make every time everything perfectly, but the small turns are making like super small differences. Like if you are making the preparation, that's the key how to how to make like better better results then. Because that's the like 20% with the preparation, you know? Like if if it was at the beginning like 50-50, with preparation you can easily get to 80. You can easily get if I if we were just preparing it our team not, it's easily 80-20 for us. I mean, talking about preparation, you talked about ladder versus in-houses, but uh, also one important part is obviously scrims against uh, other teams that may be playing in the tournament. And uh, we, for example, have uh, Team UK there with the banger tweet of uh, going 0-4 in scrims. Um, Was it 0-6? So no, we played. We just played uh, Croatia twice and we lost 0-2 to both times. <laughs> Were you guys like disheartened after that, or were you like, okay? Um, I mean, even I, it, it was it was on Friday. I was like, you know what, guys, we got our uh, bad luck out, our int out. <laughs> Tomorrow we're gonna smurf. <laughs> I'm, I'm mean, glad. I'm glad I could give you the free win then on, yeah, on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is in general, is it like uh, obviously memeing around and stuff is really important, also uh, just to keep team morale up. But yesterday we had also a discussion that between the teams, uh, is it like, uh, we didn't notice it obviously in the official Riot stream, but like in this games that are not streamed, is there some like funny emoting going on or anything or 
uh, are all of the teams a bit conservative when it comes to that here? Uh, I personally, I hate emoting. It's just something that ticks me off. So the second I see someone emote me, I mute them on ladder or uh, in tournament, whatever it will be. I'm going to insta emote you. So uh, I think I'm piloting next week, so you're free to like start emoting me. But the second you send an emote, you're going to be squalls for the rest of the game. So it won't, uh, I won't see it. <laughs> I don't know how many scrims the other teams did. We 